Blitz is defined as a sudden savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> shit, man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. I am Jeff Howe, and we have reached the end of spring practice. Got a few more to get in this week before the Longhorns. Get it on at DKR on Saturday under the lights for the spring game, and then the pads go away until August. It's not going to be that long, guys, before we're actually talking about football. I would say uh, spring game crept up on us pretty quickly. Yeah, too. it did. Yep. Thought we had a little time, but yeah. no, it's like, no, we're the week of it right now. But mm-hmm. you know when we get to those dog days in like June and July, Rod, before media days hits, it, uh, yeah, it's, we're, we're going to be struggling for things to talk about, as always. Well, now that we have a quarterback, we are. Usually yeah. it's just, it was pretty easy. You just always default the conversation was, ah, man, who the hell is going to be the quarterback? It like, used to be, how yeah. long can, like seven, how long can we same. put off this quarterback conversation before we really get to dissect it? But. Yeah. I mean, that's what that used to be. Now it's like, oh, so I'm with you now. Yeah, what are you? Now you guys have more nuanced conversation about Texas football. Right. It's not so easy. It's like, oh, so what's what's the what are the issues right now? Right. I could point out a few. I guess we'll get into it. We will definitely <laughs> get into it as we go on we like into to complain. We're becoming grumpy old men. Today's presentation. <laughs> uh, let me bring in the rest of the team. Here's the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. How are you, sir? Doing pretty well. And Rod's right. It's like we had did the same show for like eight years for a while. We did. <laughs> it was. It was like Groundhog Day. I was just Texas. Right. It was just <laughs> it was just quarter back discussion. I remember those. I mean, By the end of it, Bill Murray wanted to kill himself. He just started <laughs> jumping off buildings and stuff. Yeah, it did not make us smarter and more intellectual <laughs> like it did Bill Murray. No, right. no. Uh, a man who is intellectual, he is smart because he is a renaissance man. The renaissance Thanks, man Bill. of the Austin Radio Network at 104.9 The Horn and uh, here on Longhorn Blitz. By the way, on The Horn, you can get him one to three weekdays on the broadcast. Same you got 104.9, 101.9, AM 1260. Get it on the Horn app, hornfm.com, where you can hear. Uh, Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All-American, 2002 semifinals for the Jim Thorpe Award, former fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and he with the Hamilton Tiger Cats at the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas in the 40 acres where he earned his degree. One day, we promise, he will get that T-ring back in <laughs> and he will wear it proudly. <laughs> Nevertheless, he's a card-carrying member of DBU, a black card member of DBU. Number 21 in your program. Number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And Rod, let me start there. When we talk about the spring football discussion, coming All off right. the second scrimmage, uh, which I've heard you say is the most important scrimmage of the spring. Yeah, uh, I, th- I kind of I tend to think they're all important this spring because you're getting a look at a lot of young well, guys. I agree with you're, you. You're building depth, so I think every game like situation. And Todd Orlando had an availability with him this week. He alluded to that. Hey, every game like situation this defense can get Good in, point. the better you're going to be. But the talk of the second scrimmage, the talk of the spring, yeah, the home run decision I by Tom know. Herman and this staff Give it to me. have been to put Jordan Whittington at running back. Boom. He and Keontae Ingram. This is how good the offense was in the scrimmage. Staff didn't even issue a defensive player of the scrimmage award. I know. I was mm-hmm. waiting on that. Their two, okay, scrimmage, M- their two scrimmage MVPs were Keontae Ingram and Jordan Whittington. I was like, that's kind of disrespectful. But I guess Tom Herman maybe wants to – that's how you know Tom Herman wants to pump up the defense. And Because I think – remember he first came in, he was disrespecting the Texas defense. Remember he called the defensive line a bunch of fat boys? Yeah. Uh, you know I, mean? I think he when he does that, I think those are like subtle shots that – all right, none of y'all were even worthy enough. Now, I'm sure we'll get into some of the guys who probably could have been right. the uh, the defensive players of the scrimmage. But let's get to Jordan Whittington and Keontae Ingram. All right, so. Uh, I heard you say on the broadcast. You know, it's the truth, man. They, I'm willing to say yeah. I'm, it. it's, I'm humble. You have, you have the title right now, Rod, of in the history of this football program being the greatest number 21. I am the no, greatest 21 awesome. in the history of Texas football. I am. No, but, and I, you know, I give props to all the other 21s. Uh, the, the Duke Thomas, the Blake, Blake Gideon. Gideons out there, all those guys. You know but I mean? you think within the next three to four years that you will no longer have that title? No. I'm going to enjoy it while I can. 
I'm gonna enjoy it for the next. I hopefully it it doesn't go away. And, or you and just say his I'm fresh, the best <laughs> number twenty one this it, defense it, has ever seen. No, I, yeah, I might have good. to like get specific with it because now I think Jordan Whittington when he's done. Not his freshman year, hopefully. Hopefully I did more than, you know, him to be able to eclipse me as the greatest 21 in Texas football history just in his first year. But from what I hear, um, he's the real deal, man. He, and he's number yeah. 21. He's going to be the he's gonna be the greatest number 21 in the history of Texas football. He is. I, and I don't even know. But like this, I'll say this. And I was hanging out with Ramon Taylor huh? last weekend. He had this Ramon Taylor Youth Association Kickball game. Remember the weather was really bad though, kickball. so yeah. kickball didn't work out. So it ended up turning into like a, a basketball game. And, 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 and so anyway, um, I Ramont's think can dunk better Jordan than Jordan anyone. Whittington will be what Longhorn fans wanted. Ramont Taylor. I hoped he would be. He has that kind of potential. Like remember the expectations for Ramont Taylor once oh. you saw him, you were like, Oh my god! Oh. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's that. That is. I was oh that Oklahoma God. State that comeback is, his freshman <laughs> oh year God. was whenever he yeah. just. I mean, he shot out of a slingshot yeah. no, like ice he's skates. He's still dunking. He's still throwing alley hoops. No, we were at the. Like the I've heard he's the best dunker. Like he, he could was win throwing at. alley hoops to himself, and I'm like to myself, he's still in like dad shape, and he's throwing alley hoops. I can't even dunk anymore. I can't even dunk. Like if I, I can't dunk in any regard unless you you lower the hoop down to nine feet yeah. or something like that. At this point in my life. This dude is throwing alley hoops himself. He is still a remarkable right. athlete. Like, he's a freak. And I remember what the expectations were when I was, you know, playing in the league, and people were like, no, no, dude, they got a freak there. This dude's a beast. And obviously, off the field issues, uh, you know, deterred that, you know, that career for him. But I think Jordan Whittington, and as long as he doesn't make Ramon's Taylor decisions, <laughs> that he will be what everybody thought Ramon's Taylor was going to be. He has that, like Reggie Bush type of freaky, crazy stuff. And he doesn't have that, like, Reggie Bush game-breaking speed, but he's he's got, like, it's almost like game-breaking fluidity, if that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense. You I, know what I mean? It, I watched him, the first time I watched him in a game setting was when he was a sophomore in high school, and you could tell even then, uh, just the guys that – and I don't know, Rod, if he'll ever test well. Like, I don't know if his, you know, that's kind of one with five, ten, five, exactly. or forty are ever going to get to blow anybody that's why I away. I don't know if he's Reggie. That's why even the Ramon say things. I think Reg, Ramon's would have tested well. You know yeah, I mean? Ramon's, mm-hmm. I think his senior year at Belton, I think he won the five A state championship. I want to say in the long jump and the hundred. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he was a he would a guy would have tested like a freak too. Right, you but know what I mean? Jordan Whittington is just one of those guys that. There's a Quandre Diggs like quality to Jordan Whittington, and what I mean by that is Step when you watch Quandre in high school, whether he was playing defense, offense, whatever it was, you're like, you know what? I bet whatever position he played, he'd probably be the best guy on the field at it. Yeah, that's what Jordan Whittington reminds me. Like everybody gets focused on, and rightfully so, on the 334 rushing yards he had in the state championship game and the five rushing touchdowns. You break Eric Dickerson's conference record, you break Jonathan mm. Gray's state championship game record for rushing yards, but. He was a defensive MVP of that game too, so yeah. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. I can't believe that I, I didn't really know that either. Actually. That, right. So that. that just shows you like this kid just freak. put him somewhere, yeah. and he's probably going to be the player. best guy you could put at that position. Yeah. I mean, football I'm sure player. if he was at Z receiver right now, Rod, he'd be the best Z receiver in the program. Maybe. No, I'm with you, man. I've heard yeah, I've heard great things. So, and I've heard they're putting a lot on this plate, and I rightfully so. In He's a prodigy, so load is played up. You know, and what I mean? think yeah, Ramont's won state in long jump, if I'm reading this correctly, yeah. and finished fourth in the 100. Fourth in the 100. What okay, he, my he bad. Won long jump there? in 2003, 10.59, <laughs> and then he. This is says, 5A though, right? Yeah, yeah, 5A state meet. He finished first in 03 and in 04 in long jump, 25 and. Uh, so he's a 25 foot long jumper and yes. ran a sub 10 6. Yes, and then he won state down. the next year, only jumping like 23 and a half. Like, oh. He, <laughs> oh, it was only, 20, he went only down 23 and a half feet. inches in one state again. 10, 500 meters, 25. And then long 25 jump. and then a three yeah. quarters of an inch added on top. Okay, yeah. so. You know what I mean? Like that. So, yes, I don't know if John Wings was is that. As I, saying, I think Reggie Bush probably was in that same realm as freakish. Short space quickness, but like, it's, it just. It's, he's, yeah. was yeah. so crazy. He's, he's fl- man, in terms of being, I think you're right. Your Quandre Dick comparison is right on. Because mm-hmm. I think he is just such a great football player, and everything is so natural to him. Even everything about the game is natural to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like all the – you're talking about the short area quickness, uh, having the Compact. hands, having the – yeah, the, the – you know what I mean? All that stuff, the the agility, get being explosive, getting in and out of breaks. Yeah, you probably could have put him at safety for Texas and, 
He'd have, you know, he'd have been just fine too. Natural, with a nickel for natural <laughs> functional athleticism. It's I like think that, is yeah, the yeah, label you could put on Jordan Whitting. When you look but at even it, more just than a, that, like the, I mean, the ability in it just a foot like on a sports IQ or football IQ to be able to shift positions like that, man, it's freaky. Trust me, from a guy, I was a people consider me a decent athlete. I was pretty damn good mm. an athlete, but I studied cornerbacks specifically so I could be good at that at that cornerback position. Now, I couldn't have been Nathan Vasher. Nathan Vasher, I think, is kind of one of those guys. I think he was, you know, Quandre Diggs. Like, you probably could have put him at slot receiver and he'd have been just yeah, fine, too. I agree. You know what I mean? So, I think they are, yeah, I think those guys are rare, though. Those guys right. are, you know what I mean? Like, those guys are freakishly rare. But that's, you know why, I, that's why you're seeing him have the spring he is he's having, yeah. though, because that is that is rare when you see that. Um, I think Todd Orlando, oh, man, I'll make sure I get the quote right because uh, Brian Davis tweeted it out there. Earlier about uh, Todd, he was asking, t- he was talking to Todd Orlando and Tim Beck. He said Todd Orlando said that he even, you know, recognized that Jordan Riddington's the guy. Yeah, he said he didn't want to steal Tim Beck's thunder because yeah. we were going <laughs> to yeah. talk to Tim Beck next. But he's like, Jordan Riddington's been really good this it's spring. It's like your Caden I mean, Stearns on lot, offense. Yeah. He's going to be a like an impact like Caden all- Stearns had in, on defense yeah. as a freshman. You know what? That's pretty good. Like yeah, he's he like could. the offensive Stearns when he you could. look at his. Because we were saying the same things he about Caden Stearns last spring. He could, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know what? By I agree the end with of you. spring, you're like, oh, he may be the best overall athlete. Well, out because there. I think, and I know Kenton Ingram wasn't here in the spring last year, but I bet once we get to training camp, I think he. And it, this is because he came in early too. But I, I, even if he didn't come in early. Jordan Whittington is going to be ahead of where Keontae Ingram was. No doubt. We, all, we were all very impressed with Keontae Ingram and still are. He's put on like 10 to 12 pounds of muscle, and I've heard he looks even faster and more explosive with some added weight, which is exactly what you need. I've just seen him and, on the hoof running, like running drills, and yeah. He, you know what I mean? He looks like a five-star impressive. running back. Like, exactly. And, no, and, no. and think about that Texas right now coming out of spring to have those two be the guys that won the MVP, and you have both at potentially the same position. Texas hasn't had, other than Deontay, you know, the past, I mean, since Malcolm Brown, you haven't had been able to have multiple guys in the backfield like that. Gray and Brown year was okay, but like you were saying, the way that Ramonts was added on to a Jamal and just the assortment of weapons, like when you can weaponize your offense and now you go from being a program that didn't get production out of that position to maybe have having your two of your best standouts and freak athletes at that position. I don't know if there's been a more drastic turnaround for any position in at, at Texas. That fast. Remember, you know what I mean? Like within basically last spring, I believe I was making and a statement wide receiver, dude. that we this did it. was. But no, I wasn't but, making that statement about wide receiver. Well, just I was saying, wide receiver at Colin years. Johnson, Lil Jordan. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was making a statement about the running back position, yeah. that it was the least talented position at, at Texas, and it had been for a while. Um, that we had seen in a long time, like it was, it was, it, it was no doubt, just had no dynamic talent there. And as Matt went out, within basically, you know, an off season, <laughs> no, a season and an off season, you end up now turning it into. I think you could argue it's one of the strengths on the team. And you now did. with Jordan Whittington and Keontae Ingram, and now Dan, Dan Daniel Young can play a role where when you throw him in there, and I've heard he's actually having a good spring. Do you and throw him in a role that's more suited for what he what he brings to the table? There you go. You Not an every down guy. But it'd be yeah, your C.J. Anderson. Type guy. Yeah, whatever it is. ball right there. Yeah, at it. And like that depth is power. so big. And remember just like – Four years ago or whatever, was that three years ago? And somehow John Harris emerges as our best wide receiver. Like, Texas had no weapons across the offense. You saw this last couple years revamp the wide receiver to become an area of depth and be something that was a luxury. And then now you're seeing it at the running back. Like, you didn't have – anything at skill and that was the biggest issue I, other than the offensive let, let, line let, let and me just argue, great to see the all the way across the board raising the level of all three. No, no no you're right about that no no doubt about it that's a good point and because i think wide receiver and i know you can say that running back too this is just texas because matt makes a great point i think it's just under under undeveloped and underdeveloped talent i mean even even the wreck even when we were talking about going back to john harris days i mean look at the fozzy whitakers that comes yep. out and then the malcolm brown the Marcus, that comes Marcus, out Marcus Johnson, and then the marcus roster, johnson yeah. that comes out like yeah like, there's man, a couple just, of them but just, not few of those guys. we have a whole yeah. laundry yeah. list of I guys think, there and i think those guys were guys that were they, they didn't have really high ceilings I think now you're going back to a group with really high ceilings. Those were your depth guys back in the day when you're good. You want those to be your five and six guys. And remember I gave you my 30-40 stat that I love that 
uh, you know, there are only a certain amount of players in college football that have at least 30 rushes and 40 receptions in a season. Mm -hmm. Usually an average is like 12 to 15 per year in all the FBS. Texas' last two were Chris Obanaya in 2008, Eric Metcalf in 1988. Mm -hmm. Jordan Whittington is, has the best chance probably since Ramon's Taylor. I think Daje and maybe DJ Monroe could have been in that category if they had used them correctly. But he has got the best chance to be in that statistical realm of special, right. unique skills since Eric Metcalf or, you know, and Chris Obanaya, he's underrated, but maybe yeah. since Eric Metcalf. Mm -hmm. I By the way, I, I, forgot to, I forgot to bring this up uh, when we were talking about Pro Day a couple weeks ago, but you mentioned Daje, it just kind of rang a bell. You talk about underdeveloped talent, underutilized talent. Yeah. You realize, like, I ran a four four. I, he went. I I saw him. I watched it sub four four. I know some people say yeah, like four that. four three three four three four. And like know, he just, he's he still got it. He like, still got. He can still go out there and wreck shop. I hope he stays in shape and gets ready for the XFL. Maybe the XFL, if it doesn't work out for him, let that be his last shot. Because he's one of those guys we remember. Like, no, no. That guy is a game breaker. Yep. Yeah. Like just put the ball in his hands. He can make something happen. He just he was at Texas at a bad time. A lot yeah. of guys were at Texas at a bad time. If Jay Johnson was on campus right now, Tom Hearn would be salivating. Yeah. At the th <laughs> Kirk Johnson is basically everything we <laughs> Kirk Johnson is what DeJay Johnson could have been, and now he can't stay healthy either. Cause um, here's something, though, Rob, back to the Jordan Whittington conversation We didn't even mention Kirk Johnson in the depth of running back. Well, because he's had the stinger, and he's I been know. out. I mean, it's just we are so, talking about, oh, you're going to have enough depth, and now it's like you, your top two backs are, have just torched this defense. And granted, it's a defense that's missing pieces, but, you know, uh, there's a clip floating around of a run Keonta Ingram had. I mean, I don't care what pieces you're missing. If you can break a tackle at the line of scrimmage and burn off on a defense that's got speed like Texas does, burn off on for 40, 45 yards yeah. for a touchdown, I mean, I agree. That's, just a, that's just a great player making a great play. And, yeah. you know, Tim Beck mentioned that in his availability. Rod, going back to, you know, there were times under Charlie Strong, really until Deontay Foreman was healthy and had that breakout year in, in 16, <laughs> it had been a while since we had seen a back at Texas be able to just maximize runs like – you know, if it's block, yeah. if it's blocked for eight, can you get me? Can you get me? Can you can get, you get me, me twelve? Yeah, yeah, ten to twelve. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's blocked for ten, can you get me twenty? Yeah. You know, if it's blocked for one, can you get me four? Surprisingly, uh, Trey Watson did a good job of that this year. Yeah. I thought Trey Watson did it. You know what I mean? He it did. He had was... one run in the Sugar Bowl where it's like, <laughs> yeah, he broke a tackle around the line of scrimmage and popped off for about seventeen. I could point yards. out probably five or six runs right now in my head where. It was blocked, you like you said, for four or five, and then Trey Watson broke a tackle, beat that one man, and then made it a seven or eight yard run. But that, right. but now you're talking about guys that can do it consistently, like and, literally on every play. And not yeah. only do you have that now, but with the skill sets of both these guys, and really Whittington's skill set, Rod, the personnel packages you can have in this offense, and and when you look at the spring game, I don't know how dynamic we're going to see in terms of diversity with the personnel groupings and, and yeah. things like that. I would imagine. I would imagine, for, imagine for the most part they'll be in eleven personnel. And it'll, it'll be, be a pretty plain Jane. That's what everybody gets plan. to see. Right. That's why. That's why the second scrimmage actually is big because that's when you do a lot of the. You know what I mean? You're cre you, a lot of stuff. You're you're trying to innovate and be creative with. You do that. But you throw scrimmage. in. You look at with the spring Jordan Whittington's had the development of Keontae Ingram, the development of Cade Brewer, who from what I've been told, the coaches yeah. have said, what little we've seen. Looks like he could end up being a five tool type tight end. Rod, you can go with your twenty one personnel. You can go with your your twenty personnel. And now the fact that we've heard Brew McCoy's working in the slot a little bit, like the the diversity you have on offense to just be able to mix and match with your personnel groupies. You're not stuck with one. This is what we've got. This is what we got to make the most of. Um, it's it's open new doors that this offense didn't have access to last year. Uh, I totally agree. Even add on, and I, I don't know if it's something they're experimenting with. I mean, I've heard Malcolm Epps is doing having a really good spring. Some of somebody with, with that kind of body mass, because he's, you know, he's about twenty pounds heavier than even Colin Johnson out there. And two two forty two is what Tom Brady <laughs> said. Posing the same kind of threat. Yeah. The NFL is looking at him as a tight end. Why not do with him what you did with, you know, guys, you know, back in the day where you can flex that that you know that tight end position. And basically have him as a flex tight end when you're passing the the football. When basically have him matched up on a linebacker or a safety, and can guarantee that because you are basically in your personnel package. You're using him as a tight end. I mean, not, and I'm saying now his hands in the dirt. And I'm talking about Lily flexed out. When I when mm -hmm. I 
and I've got to go back and try to find some clips of when he played because the memories are kind of hazy. Hey, Dan. When I look at Malcolm Epps, I think of Lavelle Pinkney. I <laughs> uh, yeah, see, that was before my time. Yeah, yeah I don't even no, know I if I remember Lavelle. Lavelle was. I don't a know if I remember buddy. watching Lavelle though. So that yeah. was like the first I remember of Texas it, I having yeah. anything as a little kid was Lavelle Pinkney, Lavelle Pinkney and Mike name. Adams and those two just as wide receiver. And Mike and his big body guy. type. Whenever he got you know people talk, he was one of the first ones that you saw that huge. But he was like the tight end. He's like Limus Swede reminded me of a Lavelle type guy. Whenever you saw his body fill out and both being like a tight end in high school. But this is the evolution of this offensive staff rod it's taking a guy like malcolm epps and you recruit him as a tight end and kind of the knock on him was well we don't know if he's going to block and and this that and the other but it's it's taking that guy and say you know what forget about what he can't do what can he do he has a huge where can he help us and now you're taking that and, and you're maximizing him and you're putting him to good use you're not hung up on let's make him a tight end let's try to fit him into this box and you're saying no damn the box Let's put him at X receiver, where a position where we can sacrifice a little bit of speed for a guy that can just go up and use his frame again at 6'6", 242, Red and go target. win jump balls. And you know, don't don't lose sight of this with Malcolm Evans. One thing I look at a lot when you talk about prospects is like, well, who offered them? Like, what what other schools were interested? And keep on, Malcolm Epps was committed to Alabama at one point. Mm. Now they went their separate ways. But at one point in time, that was a kid that Nick Saban said, not only am I going to offer that kid a scholarship, I'm willing to take his commitment right now. Yeah. That, to yeah. me, tells you the yeah. type of natural talent like you're Belichick with. bringing you in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, But I, I think it just goes back to going back to the first year, and rightfully so. You know, We did it on this show, and I know reporters did it. Um, everybody that's on the radio did it. Harping on this staff and criticizing them for not using guys properly, not making the most of what you had and said, kind of getting hung up on what you don't have. But last year, whether it was the use of Colin Johnson, the use of little Jordan Humphrey, how Trey Watson impacted this offense, making the most out of Andrew Beck, we saw them taking the pieces they did have and maximizing this offense, mm-hmm. what they were able to do with Sam Ellinger and short yardage packages. But now, now as Matt said, now that you've got more weapons, you, you've recruited really well the last two cycles and it's starting to show – now it's like, okay, let's not get hung up on what this guy can't do. Let's take what these guys can do well and how do we fit that into what we want to do. Yeah. I think – sorry, go ahead. No, go. Uh, no, I think even more so than that, taking it further, I think they want those guys who have the ability to to stretch the offense, basically. It's like, you know what I mean? You want the, the stretch big man in basketball, the guy that can, you know, play multiple positions, that can also hit the three-pointer, mm-hmm. but can also go down low. I mean, that's the same thing these – I think the coaches are trying to uh, covet all right now. Right. Like, look at it. Situational I mean, Jake football. Jake Smith. Yeah, I mean, Jake, it, Epps is your tight end slash wide receiver hybrid. Jake Smith's your running back slash wide receiver hybrid. So is Jordan Whittington. I mean, there are more of those, I think, guys that are high level being recruited by Tom Herman because I think he wants that ability to be able to bring a guy in who can play multiple positions and expand – his pro spread philosophy. If he can't do it, and I think he's going to do it, like theoretically, he's going to do it with, you know, bringing in Larry Fedora and bringing in all these different guys who are going to help build on his philosophy. But even that on the field, why don't you bring in players who will expand it themselves, like the personnel packages? They'll make you multiple. Like Jordan Whittington makes you multiple. If you want to maximize them and weaponize them, so does Malcolm Epps. So do, you know, guys like Jake Smith. I think Tom Herman wants to challenge his offense. I think he's yeah. doing it. And you saw that even – he's from the Urban Meyer tree. Urban Meyer loves those guys. Going back to Percy Harvin and mm-hmm. all that. I mean, he oh, he loves – That's them. a great one. You know, Aaron Hernandez team. was one of those guys. I mean, he loves those guys. So I think he's just him kind of going back to the roots of what he learned about offense. Those guys are matchup – not just nightmares. They're horror shows. Yeah. Because when, that when guy – When you brought up Harvin right yeah. there, it made me think of Whittington being utilized as that – use yeah. all piece that they have and then I mean you look at Herman and how he likes to weaponize his offense and these are all tools the same way a goal line is the one area that you either can get the most results or least results so the difference between that field goal and touchdown so immense and look at the tools that he's brought in a guy like Ellinger that seems to be an automated touchdown machine inside the short yardage but then you have a Colin Johnson type target that can play in no matter where you're at de facto first you have the running quarterback but then we have a guy that can catch a ball on the plane that nobody else can catch it on so when you're well defended you still have an option and then that's the perfect thing Colin Johnson's going to be leaving you're going to lose say 
that asset, but have a guy like Epps that can be multiple, like you're saying, possibly line up different spots, possibly have a ceiling, but then can immediately be just a red zone tool the way that if you look at the NFL and look at red zone targets, there are certain types of tight ends. And like you see every team has one of these guys from what Eric Ebron used to be to a guy that, you know, you weren't necessarily a good tight end, but you have this one highly needed skill at that level that can still be undefensible. And you go across the list of the Jesse Jameses or the Vance McDonalds and these big bodies that are guys that – nothing that stands out athletically, but they have a tool that nobody else can defend. And if you have that in the red zone in addition to your running quarterback and now on third down you know no matter what you have worst option is throwing a ball up to those guys. What L.J. Humphrey made him such a good receiver is because yeah. he played bigger than he actually was. I don't want to get too hung up on this, Rod, and, and talk big pictures because I want to talk some spring game before we yeah. get out of here. But – you talk about evolving this coaches. offense and kind of the marketplace of ideas. Uh, well, you mentioned hiring Larry Fedora, uh, bringing in Andre Coleman from Kansas State. Mm -hmm. Now I asked Tim Beck about that during his availability, kind of how how those guys have felt from a self scouting standpoint. And he said, you know, you have guys that have head coaching experience or coordinator experience there. They might look at things differently than you do. And in his exact words, where he's like, "It's forced me to continue to grow." And yep. If that's what the goal for Tom Herman was, then it sounds like mission accomplished. Like, hey, uh, and Tim Beck described it as like, hey, you know, they might look at, you know, something and say, hey, have you done this? Have you thought about this? Have you tried this? Yep. What about this? Which is why you bring those guys in. And add that on top of, I want to know your level of excitement when you heard about this. We knew he was the clinic speaker for a while, but Sean McVay is the keynote speaker at the uh, Texas Coaches Clinic mm -hmm. over the weekend. And Tom Herman said he came in early, spent two hours with the offensive staff. I know. I know. Tom Herman said, just talking ball, ideas. Come on now. Uh, talk red zone, RPOs, mid zone versus tight zone, good conversation. So, And I know that knowledge is out there. But, man, you just never know what's going to un – little nuggets going to unlock. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, how many times have you been, like, stuck on a subject or something or a topic that you're writing about or whatever? And the right and person then, articulates another yeah, aspect. Yeah, and then somebody drops something on you or, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, you do a little research and you go, oh, oh. This is this ties it all together. You opened a new portal, and now you can snowball down. Yeah, hill like and go it into is. It. So I, 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 man, I can't imagine that two hours. I mean, if I had, if you had two hours, a coach with Sean McVay just to, you know. Just to have access to football that football time. mind. He's offensive must champion, like a watching our <laughs> offense, helping us, you know, you know, make you know, make personnel uh, choices and giving us options. That's a beautiful thing. And the still photo yeah, that Belichick, was what two years, uh, three years ago, right? Uh, yeah, Belichick. seventeen. So two years ago, yeah. Yeah, two years ago, Belichick. So nice group. yeah, man, I like that. And if you saw, I'm the sure photo. that was big for Todd Orlando to have Belichick in. Yeah, if Belichick yeah. spent ten minutes with you. That's pretty damn good. Yeah, I think, just I think Tom sniff. Tom Herman said I think Bill Belichick spent four hours with them. Uh, yeah, he awesome. said a lot. A lot of it was, you know, program building and maintaining success. Hey, that's all good. Four principles. Yeah, I mean, I'm all good with that. I'm I would imagine good. there were some defensive <laughs> the ideas. The fact that he's I'm talking to anybody I'm else about that. football. No, trust like... me, Belichick probably didn't reveal much. Let's be honest. Yeah. Belichick, oh, yeah. didn't, he doesn't even tell his nah. assistant coaches anything. That's why they all suck when they leave Belichick too. <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> he tells nobody. <laughs> when, <laughs> it, that's Only why he, I... even Brady, doesn't know what he's gonna do. Hell, he bitched Malcolm Butler before the Super Bowl, <laughs> the starting quarterback, right. and nobody still knows why he did. They still don't know. He don't answer to anybody. <laughs> He's the emperor of the dark right. side. He's oh, the so, of the crop. as we start right. looking ahead of the spring, so Rod, I, I just wanted to because I know you're a big Sean McVay fan. Oh man, and I mean that's just two hours of hey, pick yeah. This, pick this guy's brain for two hours. He'll probably bring in Shanahan next or somebody like that. Like he, because I, yeah, I wonder who's gonna bring in because. He's trying to – I can see what he's doing. He's obviously trying to keep in, like, the marquee minds or something. Mm -hmm. So, I wonder who you bring in next when you brought in Belichick and Sean McVay. Like, who yeah. do you – Got to hit next? those home runs first. Yeah, who, I mean, who's Worry next on your list? Next. I mean, seriously. And I'm, oddly, I'm Sean McVay looked more who's happy next to see on the him. list if you're bringing in Belichick? I mean, do you go old school to bring in Parcells? Like, who do you <laughs> – No. What do you do when you bring in I mean, in I would think Sh Shano's got to be up there, right? I think as, Shano's got to be up the tie to Texas. That's why I think – He's going to bring in Urban Meyer next year. I don't mm, see that to happening. To talk football? No, yeah. Uh, no, no. They, got, they, got, they got a little beef. Nah, I don't Did see they? that. Oh, not just now. Wait till Urban Meyer's out for a while and they know he's not going to come back to coach. I think right now. I'm just now, trying to think no. of a big name. I, that I think he bring in that. Bob Stoops before he brought in Urban Meyer. Yeah. I'm not joking. I think, I think Bob Stoops right yeah. now, the XFL, I think he'd have a better shot. I do know there, there is mutual <laughs> respect between Tom Herman and Bob Stoops I know after, there is. after uh, U of H beat OU yeah. in that opener a couple of years ago. They, I mean, there's, there's respect there. Yeah. Bob Stoops and Mac Brown had a different relationship. I, I'm than with you, Rod. Tom Herman. I, I would I would bank on Bob Stoops being a clinic speaker 
at before Texas Urban Meyer. before Urban Meyer. Yeah. yeah, but I wonder who he's gonna. Yeah, you got to bring yeah, in somebody big now. Minds though at that level, that's an odd one that's available to talk. I so think Kyle is to me the most likely to bring in that. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Just Especially if they have a big year this year with Jimmy Yeah, well, he's got the name healthy, brain. Yeah. I think they're going to have a big year because I don't know if Garoppolo And if Shano they comes back. In, like, Andy Reid or. If Shano comes back. Yeah. Oh, to, Andy to do a clinic. Yeah, well, and a Doug Peterson because he has Andy the Foles Reed. connection. But if Shano comes back Westlake, to do a clinic, does that Andy's mean we good. finally get Chris Sims back on the 40 acres for a football oh, That would be awesome if he brought Sims back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. He's, but Sims won't do it. Right <laughs> It'd be great if he did, but no. He won't do it. And by no. the way, have you caught his podcast lately? He's got a new podcast. Uh, I haven't listened to it lately. I, I actually was catching it for a while, but I haven't listened to it lately. No, yeah. he's doing a great. I mean, he's Sam's doing so many things. Go. He's doing like three different. He got three different projects, man. That's guy's hands. Your boy's on. moving on up in the world, right? Moving on. Oh, I yeah. think he'll end up being a broadcaster, like an analyst at well, one. Well, he point. already said no. He he'll, was going to take French Chesso's job at W Fan, but he was like, no, I don't want to take the biggest sports radio yeah. job in America. I want to continue my film he, stuff and work. Yeah, at NBC. he wants to. Pro yeah, grow. Like, I think he's going to end up being a broadcaster. He wants to be. In, I think he he don't, he won't admit it, but he wants to be like a color analyst, like his dad was. Yeah. yeah. He, well, yeah. and he's just more on just football analysts and guru savant. Like he's a dude that. Uh, with the social media following that he sort of has and just what he does with the pro football side of NBC and breaking down film. I yeah. think he already has sort of that niche as not being the guy in game analyst, I just but want, just being like a go to as yeah. a fo- lead football analyst. I just want that fence to be mended. Yeah, uh, I think it will at one point. I think Tom Herman, once he starts winning championships, he'll start making it a priority to deal with here's, here's, yes like that. You know what I mean? And again, I want to <laughs> talk, I want to talk spring games, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Would it be would it be too far fetched to put Chris Sims in the Longhorn Hall of Honor? No, he no, should be. He in should there. be. In there. Okay. I want to say he's like the top fans five. Might boom while he's then, getting like inducted, starting, he like top five until starting quarterbacks and all time wins. He's somewhere up. He, there. I mean, he until was, Vince and Colt McCoy are the only ones that passed him for win percentage. He's, he's, yeah, he's up there, man, with a I ton think of it's, wins. Colt, V.Y., Bobby Lane, and Sims in and terms of victories. And if you count Street 16-0 yeah, and should, or whatever. He should, yeah, of course he should. That, that, so that's there's the, way the start. To do it. There's the start. Yeah, you're yep. right. That's the way to do it. That's a, that's a, that's, a, that's pretty cool. He, he'll, you know, your ego you know, kicks in, so you may come back for that. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Well, I, just I think CDC can make that happen. Cheer him. CDC or whoever's in charge of Hall of Honor. It's a different happen. regime, yeah. and I think he'll be more receptive It's like basically if Texas fans aren't a-holes, he would probably They're not. Texas fans are past that, I believe. I think they would I would hope, yeah. If they're help. not, then yeah, man, you're being petty as a hey, you're being but petty AF. I'd be surprised. Then you yeah. you need to yeah. get a different. Yeah, ask Blake Gideon about that. If, if you're that mad, exactly. you need to get, you need to get a different life <laughs> perspective. <laughs> they can be petty. Ask Blake I would Gideon be fearful about that there would be booze <laughs> still for some irrational stupid. I think reason. there'd be fights in the stands. <laughs> no, I yeah, hope. No, I think some no, of the Longhorn no, family go. Yeah, we, yeah, would put them in check. We need to do what we said and just have an alumni game and have it we be have an Sims alumni versus flag football major, game, you know, yeah. like just Ooh. Sims' well, when team. Sam, when Sims gets team. recognized at halftime for a Hall of Honor this summer, that's how you do Major it. was better. <laughs> and you yeah. know somebody's going to say it. Major, major. And then even okay, the players Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Let's go ahead and get to, uh, <laughs> get to spring game talk. I don't want to take up too much time right. talking Chris Sims on this week's show. <laughs> Rod, I'll just throw it to you talking defense. What do you want to see? Because there's a couple of things I want to see defensively, and you could take any of these however you want them. Matt, you feel free to do the same. Uh, I want to see how this battle at nose shakes out with Keandre Coburn and Gerald Wilbon. Yeah. I want to see what you look like at inside linebacker, what combinations work, what it looks like. And I'm anxious to see development of that cornerback position. Deshaun Jameson's had a really good spring ball accounts. Jalen Green's had a good spring. Anthony Cook's still there. We've talked about needing to see development from Kobe Boyce because you're going to need him at some point. Yeah. So I know, you know, who's playing safety, all that. What does D line look like? Who's going to be your, you know, double digit sack potential guy? But I think those three positions, and other than safety, you're talking about the ne- central nervous system of the defense. Yeah. When you talk about nose, inside linebacker, but I want to see these corners. I, they, they they're going to get tested in the spring game because oh, yeah. of the, the the talent that Texas has a receiver now. But those are the three things I really want to see in terms of position groups. Those three. Um. I, I'm less concerned about corner, honestly, um, than most. And I know Tom Herman put it among his top three most, um, or at least the, the positions that concern him the most, among the top three. I think he had a second-team offensive line was number one. Yeah. Um, what does he say? Oh, cornerback, and then I think he said inside linebacker. Yeah. Inside linebacker to me is your number one priority at this point. I don't think he, he didn't run those down in order. 
like I don't think he was like one, two, three in order in yeah. terms of his preference. Oh, but he's a, yeah, yeah. It, let's be clear. I think Todd Orlando, Tom Herman, you, me, everybody listening to this podcast, I think inside linebacker is probably number one for everybody. Well, especially after the Gabriel Floyd news about spine was it spinal spinal stenosis? stenosis? Yeah, for everybody, if you did, if you didn't hear, you missed it. Gabriel Floyd has been diagnosed yeah. with spinal stenosis. He's pretty much going to miss the entire season. They're going to you know let him rehab. Oh, twenty twenty basically is when you reevaluate him, right? Yeah. Pretty much. You don't even, yeah, you know, basically, he just he's a, he's a he's gonna focus on his health until 2020, right? Which he should, because that mm-hmm. it sounds spinal anything sounds really serious. Yeah. Um, so to me, I think well, they have Caleb Johnson there now. Who's the Billy other? Day away. Yeah, a day away, and I know Jeff, they like a day away. Yeah, Jeff McCulloch they, is still hanging around. Well, oh, Jeff McCulloch, in terms of middle linebacker, you're talking about, about that it. Mac position specifically. Yeah, like let's be yeah, so let's go in there because that's what I think you just. Threw it out there. I mean, you basically just need to find two two linebackers. All right, that's what you need to find because you're going to be a nickel or a sub package seventy percent of the time. Maybe you know sixty five, but seventy percent of the time you're probably going to be in a sub package of some sort. So you need to find two good linebackers. From what I hear right now, Jeffrey McCulloch is one of those guys having a good spring. Yeah. And he looks to be working out, and that's that's a really good sign. And now you got to pretty much find whoever's going to be the guy to compliment Jeffrey McCulloch. Whether that in your in your sub packages, whether that's going to be Joseph Masai, who I know they really like, but they like him as a pass rusher, somebody on line of scrimmage, or uh, whether that's a day away, that's kind of what you got to figure out because that's what you found when you had Malik Jefferson and then you had Gary Johnson and then you had actually had Anthony Wheeler with you know Gary Johnson in the you know in the situation last year in your sub packages. <laughs> That's what you got really got to focus on. And Todd Orlando alluded to it in his availability, and Tom Herman said it when he was asked about you know position battles that are going to go beyond spring. And inside linebacker was one that Tom Herman said it's going to take some time. They're not going to get it sorted out this spring. And, and Todd Orlando said, yeah. you know, it's talking about Caleb Johnson specifically, and this summer is going to be really big for him because not just the weight work and the speed work with Nancy McKnight, but you know he's going to have a lot of film study to do mm-hmm. this summer. Playbook. Making sure, make sure he's got everything down. Here's um, just kind of spit, spitballing a potential is, concern, Rod. What if you get to August 31st and it's pretty clear your top two linebackers, and let's say there's even a gap there, which I, I think at this point I don't think it's far-fetched to suggest there might be. What if your top two linebackers are Jeffrey McCulloch and Joseph Osai? I know. That's two guys that are ideally more suited for that B-backer position. But yeah. what if among that group, what if they're just your two best guys that that's you have to have on the field? Yeah. That's like, what, what does that, that do to your front? And, and well, yeah, that's when you got to be malleable. That's why you defense, want them to be the multiple positions. It's almost and that, what you know, and th- then that depends on what's happening at safety too. Mm-hmm. All right, now how many safeties do you have that you really trust that you want you you want and need to be on the field? And right now, I say hell is three. I think they got four. I, exactly. I, I, think, I think Chris Brown's in that group now. Well, okay, and you're in so, that conference where you can sort of shade where if you have a very good against the run nickel or safeties, like they can help match yeah. those things because you're all working together. And what's happening with DeMarvion ability. Overshawn? Because he's also a guy that can solve a lot of problems for you if he's on schedule, but I don't know if he is. I think, I think this spring is the, the figure it out spring for him. He's getting a lot of reps. This we is, know that. We, I mean, we forget yeah, yeah, this, this about some of these guys. This is his spring. first spring. This is the most important, and I said this at, you know, two or three weeks ago, the most important spring for a Texas football team probably in 35, 40 years. Ooh. Going way, way back because you've never lost as much on one defense before. You've never lost as many starts. You cool. go back to the hell, the the shock the nation tour. Mm-hmm. It's probably the last time you've mm-hmm. lost as much on defense. I'm not, I'm not making it up. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm not. Go back. That's the 1990 the team. It's like the 1990, 91 yeah. team. Maybe you lost a lot, but then that's like pre internet days to so mm-hmm. go check that out. You got to ask Bill Little and Craig Way. About that kind of stuff, but I did the Craig research in the, in the internet era. There is no Texas, Texas football team in the internet era that's lost more on defense than this particular 233 team. Two hundred thirty-three combined career starts. All right, and now you're talking about a guy that was going to contend to be part of the, 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 you know, the most important, arguably part of your central nervous system, and DeGabriel Floyd. Now he's out, and now you still don't even know who your top linebackers are, even though top two. You just got one guy that you trust right now at linebacker. And I'm with you. What if it's Joseph Osai, who's better suited to basically play on the line of scrimmage and be a designated pass rusher? He's more like, um, man, what's the what's the Sergio Kendall, basically, mm-hmm. than anything else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, right? Yeah. You don't want him dropping back in coverage in the Big 12. And the other. I want him on the line of scrimmage, defending the run, rushing the passer. Mm-hmm. That's what I want him yeah. doing. Pulling an old and then, yeah, and then you got Jeffrey McCulloch, who I like him. as He has more versatility. Yeah, you can do a lot more different things with him. 
but you know he's your only linebacker that right now that you trust that may have some versatility back there in the Big Twelve. That's where you're going to be targeted. You're going to be targeted right there at your linebacker spot. So you got B.J. Foster, you got Demarvio and Overshone. You said you you know Chris Browns. He's progressing pretty well. Montrell so, Estelle's had to get some run with the so, first team. So Josh Thompson's still hanging around. You may have the deepest pool of safeties in the country. And that's so big. maybe to make up for the lack of linebacker depth, you know, you see Tarlando go, you know what? I'm putting more safety. I'm going fl- to be like the San Diego Chargers. I'm going to flood the damn field with safeties. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, dude. Every, every it, position. I'm just, some of the guys going to be playing linebacker. You know, some of the guys going to be playing nickel and dime. But I'm going to flood the field with safeties. Those are my best football players right yeah. now. You know what I mean? When I look back at, at, at experience and talent, your most talented and your most experienced position on defense is safety. And that's actually where we have seen Orlando weaponize his defense more than any other position. And that's where, like, this conversation reminds me totally about the concept that, I mean, Rick Carlisle was one of the first ones to keep doing it a ton, and they beat the Miami Heat doing it back eight years ago. But the idea of bringing in guards, and you always were thought that your defense cannot survive if you have two undersized guards, so you're basically playing a three-guard lineup in the NBA, but you're getting it back with threes. Well, this is the same type of thing that if you don't have linebackers, yeah, you're going to maybe give up some size at the DB position, but if you're giving up that size and what you're getting back in return are QB pressures, which you used with Texas's havoc rate in the top five each of the last two years yeah. against uh, Big 12 opponents. It fits the culture of the conference. It actually is how he deploys his players to make the biggest pressure making plays. And if you're getting back turnovers, you're getting back pressures, and then you're just serviceable enough. Maybe you are below average, but that trade off that you get by being eh, serviceable average against the run. But then if you actually are putting on your better playmakers, that are utilized more, you may get back in return like you did in basketball with the three-point shot whenever undersized guys were just getting twos on the other end because they're bullying some big guy down low and Beret is on LeBron or something like that. And that's literally what we've seen the NBA just realize, nope, no, nope, it's worth it. We need dueling guards. Chris Paul and you know James Harden can be the primus of examples, but when you have Orlando maybe being able to have a reason to put what pieces that he's most effective with, it could actually be a way that that works out on the plus side of expected value. I just feel like Rod mm-hmm. leaving the spring game. I don't need to see Caleb Johnson or Delia Dayway have like just some monster spring game to feel okay. Me personally, yeah, I, I just want to see enough good flashes. Look, they're as good as these running backs have been, and as good as as talented as we think this offensive line can be. And as good as Cade Brewer's been, look, there's going to be, hopefully we see this run game pop off some long runs. We see this offense sustain something on on Saturday. I just want to see enough good flashes to where you can say, okay, I can see it working with that guy on the field. Yeah, no, no, I feel you. Yeah, because I'm, at this point, you only have one proven commodity if you can consider Jeffrey McCulloch a proven commodity. He's definitely the closest thing you the closest have. Only thing you one got with any it. experience, really. Yeah, so, and th- yeah, that's why it's an ongoing project. You probably won't figure this thing out, unfortunately, probably mm-hmm. until three or four games into the season. That's what's good about spring, though. Uh, right you know now I mean? you can see who you can take can, on what, well, you who fails at what, yeah. and it doesn't hurt you. you won't be like post-LSU game, I'm even saying. Right. You won't be able to draw any – concrete opinion one way or the other after Saturday but to me it's all about the spring game with inside linebacker specifically is going into the summer are you looking at a glass half full or glass half empty I agree I agree it, it depends on I, you know what I would say glass half full because I I love Joseph Asai right. but I, I think I know what Joseph Asai is I think he's a guy that's a great pass rusher, and he's a guy that's a great run stopper. I think he needs to be on the line of scrimmage. The closer he is to the line of scrimmage, the better. You back him up, and you can get him in space. I think that's where you can exploit him. I'm saying yeah. I, I just don't – I think that's where people's opinions should be, is either glass half full or glass half empty. Okay. I don't think you can watch what happened Saturday and say, uh, these linebackers are terrible. They're going to have to do no, something there. No, you don't know Or no. uh, every, I, don't, I don't care what everybody's saying. Like, they're great. They're going to be awesome at linebackers. Not no. enough intel. It's yeah. not of intel either way. Yeah. Um, I think what I, I – I, there are a couple of things that I know, but I think Jeffrey McCulloch and Joseph Besides where you start. And maybe you get inventive and, you know, we've talked about this. Maybe you're in, in the – maybe you create something new. Maybe something new comes out you're of this. You're putting I mean, them into – Mother co- is the – yeah, I mean, you know, they always say uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, maybe out of necessity he comes up with something great. We know he loves – 
the lightning package, which is six def- six defensive backs. That's his dime package. And, you know, maybe he ends up with a, a 4-1-6 defense, basically, with a four-man front, but not, you know, three down front, but four-man front with a, a, a side on the outside right. lurking as an outside linebacker. Jeffrey McCullough kind of basically playing your inside linebacker. I, I've thrown that out there as a possibility, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? And then whoever that other safety is, whether it's B.J. Foster or DeMarvion Overshone or whatever, like they end up playing kind of that that joker I mean I don't know how he's going to actually end up formulating right. but that maybe you saw about putting your best players on the field which is what coach Aquino always said like you know what well, screw the defense that we run who are our 11 yep. best players yes all right and, and does it work out are we fortunate and blessed enough where our 11 best players end up being you know three down linemen and you know f- you know three linebackers and five DBs or whatever, something that we can obviously play in a nickel package or a dime package, or is it? Nope, you got your seven, your your six best players are all at safety, you know what yeah. I mean, or whatever it is, and then you have to build around that. I think that's what I want to see from Tyler Landry, and that's what the spring is so vital for because no other time of the year do you have time to actually experiment or put a player in an uncomfortable type well, setting. Well, he can't right now because he doesn't have his guys. Well, true. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have a full what, complement of so guys to experiment. All, so all these players right now, yeah, he'll though, be going on fate. He can go, but that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. that right now with the spring, now you have all these other guys that you can put in these situations to learn from or at least realize, yeah. oh, wait, he can't do that. Well, you really can't do those type of things in fall camp or going into the season. Like yeah. you're trying to sharpen your knives and be – May find out what we do best and get ready for games. Right now, you can actually put players out and test what their parameters can, are. It will truly be a thought experiment yes. because right now you got your third string safety, Demarvio and Overshone playing. You know your two starting safeties when he won't be playing in that role in the yep. regular season. So the communication Very about tough. those positions is going to be all like you talk about the most inexperienced defense you've had in thirty years. Like I'm telling you, if you're but talking if right now, you're probably freaking up. out. You know what yep. I mean? Like it is a lot going on, and you don't really have right now enough of a test sample for any of these positions to go into training camp and go, this is where we're going to start Mm -hmm. my experimentation. Like you're going to go into it basically kind of rolling the dice into the regular season and I'm, you know, I think you should start with your safeties. I think you start with what you know, your safeties and your D line. And I think linebacker for you is like, man, I'm going to play two of you guys, you know what I mean? But I would love to have three or four, but I'm playing as little of you guys as possible. Like that, that's the position I trust the least. Yeah. Trust the D line more, and I trust the safeties, and I trust even cornerbacks more. So I think you overcompensate to deal with that. Because corner, you have talent at corner. Talent it's just imagine corner, of getting See, those guys at bats. By midseason, corner will be fine. Yeah. And the safeties are so good. They'll be able to have the back of the corners. They'll be able to be, hey, you know, I got you deep. Like, they'll be able to help those young corners. Right. Um, and I think the D-line, because I think you have some depth and talent there, Malcolm Rhodes, Saquon Graham, I think you'll be able to rush the passer and it'll also help those young corners in coverage. Where you are suffering, where you have nothing, in my opinion, that you can, you can really trust is at linebacker, specifically inside linebacker. I, I, here's how I, I see this unfolding. And one way I could see it going, I should say I see this unfolding. I, I, I'm i not expecting this to happen, but I wouldn't be shocked. Todd Orlando really needs to find three inside linebackers. Pretty much. For your depth, you really need three guys. I McCulloch we know is going to be one. He's one. And if you only have two, if it's Caleb Johnson or it's Delia Dayway, I wouldn't be completely shocked, right? if we got to the second week of camp and hear DeMarvion Overshone's back at Rover and you've moved Jeffrey McCulloch to Matt. I would. Okay, I'm down with that. I'm down with that. I because we talk about you know kind of rolling yeah. the dice. If I'm ta- if I'm Todd Orlando, you've seen enough of Demarvion Overshone this spring to at least have an idea. Okay, I agree with you. within the framework of our defense. And, and keep in mind, when Gary Johnson got here, that's all they asked Gary Johnson to do. Like, well, we don't need you to do anything else. We just need you to play rover. Like yeah. that's the one position you're going to learn. That's it. Don't worry about Mac or sub packages anything else. You're going to learn this one position. Yeah. And I think they've seen enough for Demarvion Overshone this spring at safety to feel like okay. If we can move McCulloch to Matt because we got to have him on the field and he's vocal and making calls and all that stuff, but the best option you've got in terms of a playmaker is sink or swim with the Marvion Overshone. I don't. I I'm not that. expecting that to happen, no, no, but I could see that happen. That's a smart move. Honestly, you might need to do it sooner rather than later. Just anticipation. I mean, right now, what are you going to do? What you're not getting deeper at inside at, at linebacker. 
unless you make that move. You, well, I mean, I, I would think, and it's going to take. And if you, you don't have faith in it now, you not don't have enough time in spring to gain faith in it. What are you going to do? An off season drill? Say, oh, I like this guy. Like, yeah, it's not going to happen. I think I think it's just going to determine exactly what you said. Does Todd Orlando? Does Todd Orlando walk off the field Saturday night having faith that he can, of this group he can find three linebackers that he tries to put on the field? Yeah, he, he that's what I'm saying. It's like much, it's like that glass. Who fails in those situations? It's that glass half full. It's that glass half full, glass half empty thing. He's yeah. not going to say this guy can't play or this guy can't. But can he have? Okay, I can. I can wind up trusting this guy. Here's, but I I know what he needs to work on. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. is this com- player comfortable in all five of these settings? It's like okay, I may have a little more confidence about him after this spring. But if he has a couple glaring issues, you may be able to take that away from it. But other than that, when you're outside of your normal role, it is going to be hard to tell. Yeah, I think of, the, of those inside guys, I think Caleb Johnson's the guy I'm most interested to see because you watch his JUCO film, and we know he can run, we know he can hit. That's but, why you bring in JUCO, too. right? But and exactly, you don't bring it. Just why I'm anxious to see Jacoby Jones because they've got plans for that guy from everything I've heard. You're not bringing in that guy to play five snaps a game. You want him to be a, a heavy rotational type guy. Yeah, right now. I mean, he's not going to start. He's not going to beat out Malcolm Roach or Taquan Graham. But no. we know in that D line, you know, your best asset is your depth. No doubt, it is the numbers you have. I agree with that. So and and that's from yeah. from the D line standpoint. I want to see that that nose battle kind of where it is with Will Bond and Coburn. But I also want to see. How many of these guys does it look like you can count on by the time you get to to camp? Yeah, yeah. No, we talking about the, we come back to the central nervous system of the defense. Yeah, that's what we're worried about, basically. <laughs> that's our concern. Yep. And real quick, <laughs> and that's what took down the Manny Diaz's part defense. Of the central nervous system. And it system. took down Vance Bedford's defense in their yeah. second year. For Todd Lando, it's just taking a little bit longer. To shift it back to the offense, we don't have enough time to get into it. Uh, my concern, really, there's two or not concern, but things I want to see. I want to see as much of Casey Thompson as we can see just to kind of get an idea of, that. you know, what does it look like just to kind of for me to conceptualize, okay, if they had to play a game, like what would you have available for him in a package yeah. based on what he's able to do Saturday? Just Tom conceptualize he, he had a good scrimmage, right? Yeah, I had a good scrimmage and a second scrimmage, but it was kind of – there was still some – yeah. Feast or famine there, which is it's a fresh He's a fresh Yeah, no expected. doubt about it. Uh, but I want to see this offensive line. I want to see they're that number one group. How do they handle themselves? And then I want to see what you see from some of these young guys. I want to see Christian Jones get some work. I want to see Junior Angelau get plenty of reps. I yeah. want to see how Rafidi Gurmai looks at that backup center spot. So yeah. it's just – it's fun now to get to a spring game. And I know we've voiced our concerns, but rather than – Man, is this team going to have enough talent to compete? Or are they going to have this, that, and the other? First they, world do they problems. have a competent quarterback? Yeah. yeah. Now we have first world problems. Exactly. Who's our quarterback? Who's our, who's our left guard going to be? Right. <laughs> Can you find <laughs> a sixth or seventh guy on the offensive right? line? <laughs> yeah. You know? Who's going to be the backup? Who our backup quarterback going to be pretty good this year? Yeah. First world problems. Yeah. It's starting to go. feel good. Huh? That's it how is. I used to. Old spring games problems. were like that. Oh, hey, I'm going to go watch VY ball yeah. out and see who the new scrubs I wanna, are. I want to complain about not having Wi Fi. I mean, that's first world, <laughs> baby. I don't want to get. I don't want to complain about not having a roof over my head or clean water. Yes, <laughs> which I find I finally got uh, set up back on the Wi-Fi here in the building. So boom, there you go. Started started with started the show with a win already. Oh, uh, so speaking cool. of this show, real quick before we get out of here, uh, some housekeeping items. There's a couple ways you can find the podcast now. Twenty four seven Sports has a podcast page on the homepage where you can find the Blitz and all Ooh, of the podcasts across the twenty four seven Sports classy. network. On the drop right. down menu at Horns twenty four seven, there is a direct link to this podcast. You can always get us on Apple Podcasts. By the way, if you uh, are an Apple Podcast subscriber or however you get your show, please leave us a review. Five stars would be preferable, but you know, go ahead and leave us a review. You can even unsubscribe and, and re- resubscribe. That helps, too. And oh, nice. uh, rate the show, so help like us out. M- multiple ways now you can get the Blitz. Big thanks to Connor Tapp and everybody in the home office for getting the ball rolling on 24-7 Sports Shout Podcast. Shout out. Exactly. All right, Matt, thanks for everything, man. You're more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge, sir. Anytime, brother, anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in a podcast game for everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn, 104.9, 1019AM, 1260. Streaming on the Horn app and at hornfm.com where you can get Rod B. on the Rodcast each and every week from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. Weekday from 1 to 3, I should say. And thanks to Matt. You can get us, like I said, anywhere you get your podcasts and get our classic interviews, all of our archives are on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. 
You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.